Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Cook. Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Dr. Marcus Dussaultoy. He's the Charles Simoni Professor for the Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University, a position previously held by Richard Dawkins, and the best-selling author of The Music of the Prime, he has received the Berwick Prize, given to Britain's most outstanding young mathematician, and the Faraday Prize for Excellence in Communicating Science, a fellow of the Royal Society, member of the theater group, and frequent collaborator with Simon McBurney. He has written and presented more than a dozen popular television series, including The Story of Maths and the Code. Dr. Dussotoy, welcome to the program. Great to be with you. Uh, this is a little intimidating for a professor of liberal arts, all this math and science. Uh, and, but I did my best to understand it, and I think you communicate with such clarity that it makes for a very interesting read. Uh, you start off by talking about how the desire to know is programmed into the human psyche. Say a little bit more about that. I think uh, we all have this desire to, to know, and I mean, Aristotle talks about it in the opening line of metaphysics. That it's, and I think it's all, almost um, as basic a drive in us as, uh, as humans as the desire to reproduce. The desire to know is what's given us kind of the edge in being able to survive. Um, uh, by, by knowing how the universe works, being able to predict maybe what's going to happen next, um, that uh, has, has given us as a species the edge. And I think those who didn't want to know, um, they're the ones that died out because they couldn't um, survive, adapt to new changes and things like that. So, so I, th- I think it is one of our basic survival tools. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of this discussion is about aspects of, of matter and the universe. And uh, I was interested in, particularly in the notion of dark matter, which I don't think I understand. But uh, I do. I, well, you're not the only one. Don't worry. <laughs> I do understand that only 5% of the total matter content of the universe is, is visible. And then there's this dark matter that makes up most of it. Well, um, it's very interesting that we, we, uh, we can see in the way that the uh, cosmos is kind of behaving that uh, if, if our current theory of gravitation or what, uh, gravi- gravity is correct, then um, it's the only way that we can model what is going on out there as kind of uh, galaxies interact with each other and move and uh, is if there's some other stuff there pulling it around. Um, in fact, this is uh, something that we experienced uh, as we discovered new pal- planets in our own solar system that um, uh, we understood that... Uh, um, uh, Neptune was discovered because there had to be something else out there pulling the other planets around because the, the trajectories just didn't make sense. Um, so we've called this stuff uh, dark matter, but but that there is another way we could solve this, and that's the interesting thing about science is coming up with different solutions which might answer you know the way that we see the universe. So the other one is maybe we haven't got gravity right. Maybe there are ways that we need to change the laws of gravity, just as you know, Newton had a good approximation, but Einstein realized that it wasn't subtle enough to understand everything that's going on. Maybe Einstein is, is ready for a rewrite and, and that dark matter won't actually exist. It's the, the equations of gravity that we need to readjust. So, so it's exciting. All of these unknowns are what kind of get us excited as scientists because we've got to come up with answers for the way the universe is looking at the moment. Yes, I found it interesting that before we had the kind of telescopes that could see Neptune, uh, we used that estimation of its uh, vital forces, uh, whether that's acceleration or gravity or whatever it is. Uh, yeah. we, we were able to determine that there was something out there before the telescopes. But we have developed marvelous uh, tools for looking at the universe now. I, I was reading last week that they're working on a, a three locations on Earth, a... a, a virtual telescope that's going to look at the black hole at the center of the galaxy, and I didn't know that was in the works at all. I, I think it, uh, writing this book, it 
continually amazed me um, just how much as scientists we've been able to know about our universe, despite the fact that most of us have been stuck on the surface of this planet. Very few people have got anywhere, uh, you know, out, out into space, certainly not out of our solar system yet. Um, yet with the tools that we have, whether it be, uh, you know, cu curved pieces of glass or um, the amazing tools of mathematics, uh, that we've been able to navigate so much, uh, that we know so much about what is out there, that there are other galaxies. Um, but there are limitations to what this technology can do. And um, that's one of the kind of edges in this book is about, um, you know, could the universe go on forever? If it does, how could we ever know that? Because Einstein has told us that information travels at the speed of light. Um, uh, the universe has only been going 13.8 billion years, quite long, but still a finite amount of time. So it means there's actually a kind of cosmic horizon, um, a kind of bubble surrounding us beyond which we can receive no information. Um, and so uh, despite having this extraordinary technology, um, there will always be kind of limits on how far it can see because of the basic rules of science. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we, you declare that we're probably in the golden age of science because of the rate of discovery. Uh, and, and I liked a, your quote from Stephen Hawking in The Brief History of Time who said he believes there's grounds for a cautious optimism that we're near the end of the search for the ultimate laws of nature and concludes we would know the mind of God. And is it even yes, possible? Yes, uh, he got into a lot of trouble, I think, for writing that <laughs> sentence. But, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think it is a very exciting time, especially um, actually for uh, a question which is kind of closer to home, which is trying to understand not, not the enormous cosmos, but what's going on inside our heads. Um, the challenge of understanding the thorny subject of consciousness um, is really going through a golden age because, you know, you, you mentioned the telescope that's given us an amazing view on the universe. Uh, Galileo just discovered so many new things with that tool. But we now have these new telescopes there, uh, the fMRI scanner, the EEG, which allows us to look inside the brain as it's thinking, as it's sleeping, as it's changing. Um, and, and that has produced a complete revolution and explosion um, in the subject of neuroscience. So I, I think that's one of the most exciting areas um, of science uh, active at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go through some of the, uh, the edges that you provided. The first one was easy for me to intellectually apprehend, so I'd like to start there with chaos and, <laughs> and the red dye from Las Vegas. Let's talk about that a bit. Yes, that's right. So um, you mentioned the, the red dye. I decided that I would take an object with me to the, the edge of the, each of these edges of knowledge, which would kind of help tease out the question. And so chaos theory um, is the challenge um, of, you know, if you know the equations for the way the universe behaves, um, why can't you just plug in the current data to, to know what's going to happen into the future? Um, surely with those equations, we should be able to, to know it all. Um, and so why can't we predict the role of a dice as it, a die as it hits the, the craps table? Um, and this was the discovery in mathematics of something called chaos theory, which says that, well, even if we have the equations, um, just a very small error in the current description of the universe can explode in, into a completely um, different description of how the universe is going to evolve. So we thought that you know, if we have a good approximation to the present, our equations should give me a very good approximation of the future. And that turns out to be um, not true of all systems of equations. That's why we can't know the weather, for example, beyond five days. Um, five, we have very good weather forecasts uh, for, for the next five days, but why can't we know what's going to happen next month? Um, unfortunately, the equations for the weather, which we know, are so sensitive to small changes quite often. We have this thing called the, the butterfly effect, that a small change in wind speed in a five days or ten days' time could evolve to... To, you know, there, there, there's a prediction of a hurricane happening rather than a beautiful sunny day. So um, this subject of chaos has really placed limitations on what we can know about the future, even if we have got all the equations for the way the universe works. It may not always be able to help us. Because of those subtle changes in, in uh what happens on, in the weather over time, I had to ask myself if the idea of a flapping of a butterfly wing was metaphorical or if there actually was some impact uh, when a wind is disturbed somewhere else. Does that affect the weather 
miles away. Well, you can do computer modeling. So, I mean, I think it was um, a realization uh, that somebody had when they saw the equations were so sensitive. They realized, oh, my gosh, this means that even a just little flap of a uh, change in wind speed could cause a completely different prediction. And, and it was rather beautifully captured in this idea of um, the, the, the butterfly. Um, uh, but you can do computer models, which, uh, and I've, I've been along to um, our weather station here in the UK to see how they model the weather. And they've got, you know, we've got a huge amount of data now about what the weather looks like today. Um, but they can show you how a small change within uh, five, six days, the, the prediction, it just, the, there's no real clear prediction going on. Up to five days, it seems to be pretty robust. Um, but there almost seems to be a threshold moment where these equations just suddenly um, start going off and doing wild things just with very small changes in the initial data. Mm-hmm. Does uh, Newton's new mathematical language that he created, a.k.a. calculus, how does that affect what we know about the universe? Well, this was, um, I think, the reason we felt we might be able to know the future, because suddenly Newton gave us uh, the laws of motion, uh, the way the physics of the universe works, both on a large and small scale. And then he gave this amazing mathematical tool, the calculus, which enables us to understand a world in flux, a changing world, a world which uh, is continually evolving. So if I put my foot on the accelerator in my car, the calculus enables us to say what the speed is in any given instance of time, although that speed is continually changing. Um, And it's very interesting, you know, uh, you talk about the liberal arts and science. Um, I think it's very interesting to look at the connections here, because if you look at what the the arts, what was happening in the arts at the time that Newton came up with those tools for a changing universe, you're looking at the art of the Baroque, and the Baroque is about trying to capture um, a universe in flux, in change. Uh, the architecture is all curves, the music is all changing, the art is about capturing somebody falling off a horse, instantaneous capturing of, of, uh, of an evolving, changing universe. So that, those tools that Newton came up with were very much part of a kind of a whole philosophy at that time. And it gave us the feeling like, wow, with these tools, we might be able to know everything about how the universe works. It it would almost seem to take free will out of the equation. Um, But I think chaos theory, the discovery of chaos in the 20th century, has kind of made us realize, well, even if the universe is deterministic, and that's certainly the quantum physics challenges that, but even if it is, um, we'll never be able to know enough about the universe that we feel like we can determine it into the future. So I think it's sort of... Free will can sort of sneak back into the equation uh, thanks to chaos theory. Mm-hmm. And, and while we're on uh, the metaphor of the butterfly, let's talk about a butterfly called the planet Mercury. Because that was an interesting notion, the solar system. Yes, because uh, the discovery of chaos theory was uh, not about the weather or something on Earth. It was uh, made by a French mathematician, Henri Poincaré, who was trying to understand whether our solar system is going to just keep on being stable way into the future, or, or could something wild happen like the Earth suddenly flies off into outer space? Um, we certainly feel like the universe, uh, the, the solar system, is a, like a great piece of clockwork, and it will just keep on repeating these ellipses till the end of time. But Poincaré understood that, well, actually, a very small change in the position of one of the planets could cause things to fly apart. And recently, there's been some computer analysis done, which has shown that, yeah, the butterfly in this case is the planet Mercury, that if you perturb Mercury very slightly, um, there are models where um, where it's it's not in the next five days, so you you needn't worry too much. We're talking about more like five billion years, but there are models where the, the solar system will fly apart if if Mercury's orbit is, is slightly different to the one that we think it is. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very intriguing that these equations um, that we're unable to predict, you know, they, they run from, uh, from trying to understand the weather to the solar system, but they may even affect things like the economy. So that's why politically it's important to understand, well, you know, if you've got a model for a system, uh, when can you be safe with the predictions, and and when might you not be able to know what's going to happen in the future? 
you you do spend some time talking about the solar system and so, some people have as a model a uh, a mechanism that works very much like a clock and is very predictable and others say well that may not be the case where where do we come down on that uh, the resolution of that question I, I think that uh, the model of a clockwork universe is, is a very good one because these are uh, huge objects where maybe you know the effects of the the quantum world are, are not really going to um, affect too much what it might do next um, but the, the the intriguing thing is that even a clockwork universe uh, can do some fairly wild things um, so uh, I, I think that it's a it's a good uh, kind of metaphor for the way the universe works but uh, one must kind of be prepared for even clockwork to to take you off in strange directions mm -hmm. Well, let's go from the, the huge to the tiny. Let's talk about the science of atoms and how that came about, because that, too, was an interesting treatment in the book. Yes, I, I think uh, the, the book is very much about what we know and how we know it and looking back in history. And I think that's important as we go forward, looking to find out, you know, well, what are the great unknowns and how we might sort of solve those in the future. So if you look at our model of matter, you know, the ancient Greeks thought it was made out of earth, wind, fire, and water. And then we realized, no, actually, it seems to be made out of bits. Um, uh, it's not a sort of continuous thing. Um, and we came up with this idea of the atom. And we have this wonderful thing, the periodic table, which Mendeleev discovered a pattern in these atoms. Um, so uh, we could see that there was hydrogen, oxygen, salt is made out of sodium and chlorine. And atom was kind of this idea that, well, those are the individual bits. And then we discovered, you know, next generation comes along, those pull apart, and we find that atoms are made out of even smaller bits, the, the electron, the proton, and the neutron. But then, again, our, you know, the current generation, we now realize, oh, no, those protons and neutrons aren't even indivisible, that they pull apart to these things we call quarks. Um, but my challenge in this age is, okay, that's what we think of the indivisible things now, but look back in history. We always thought we were hitting the indivisible only for that to pull apart again. So, you know, what new stories might be out there and how could we ever know that we've kind of hit the last layer? Maybe it's turtles all the way down, as that little old lady said in Stephen Hawking's book. <laughs> uh, the electrons emitted from the cathode that caused the glass to fluoresce uh, provide a, a, an impetus for looking at whether an atomic particle is here or there. And I found that uh, mind-boggling, I guess. Well, well, good. I think um, uh, there's a, uh, an old adage in the theory of quantum physics is that if you don't find it mind-blowing, then you haven't understood it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think uh, it's a good state of mind to be in if you're going, whoa, this, you know, what you're saying, that electron actually is in many places at the same time, and then it's only when you look at it that it decides where it is. And that seems very counterintuitive. That, and it certainly goes against what Newton said. Newton Newton's model is that, you know, you measure the position and the way the thing's moving, and then from there you can use calculus and the laws of motion to predict what it's going to do. But quantum physics says, you know what, that may not have a, a unique position, and every time you look it could be somewhere different. Um, and that really has challenged our, our kind of view of the way the universe works. The, the quantum world is... is a, it's a, I mean, it's a fascinating edge that uh, I think uh, I enjoyed writing and exploring because, it, as you say, it's so mind-blowing in its implications. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, my understanding is that matter behaves differently under observation. Is that part of quantum physics? Well, it's, uh, so it seems as if um, you can't really say that uh, a, an electron has a position until you make an observation, and then it has to make up its mind almost where it is. Um, so, uh, and that's, at the moment, some scientists regard as, as very strange. You know, why should an interaction need to uh, kind of change the behavior of this uh, electron? It, because surely we are all also part of some sort of quantum system. Um, so I, I think there's some, still some challenges out there about uh, this whole theory. It's a very powerful theory. It works very well. It makes incredibly good predictions. It's probably one of the best 
tested theories on the scientific books. Um, but there are some extremely counterintuitive um, aspects to it. I mean, what, one of the I took a dice on my journey to uh, the Edge of Chaos theory. Um, I took a pot of uranium that I managed to buy off the internet, amazingly, um, with me on my journey to the edge of the quantum world, because what science seems unable to tell us is that this pot of uranium, it's sitting on my desk at the moment in front of me, um, it's radiating, but it seems to be radiating randomly, that we seem not to be able to know the precise moment when the next bit of radiation will be kicked off it. And science says that that, that unknown is part of the way we must do science. There's no mechanism that will tell us when it's going to radiate. And for some scientists, Einstein included, you know, he said, I don't believe that um, uh, God plays dice, uh, that it, he doesn't, he couldn't believe there isn't some mechanism which is controlling when that uranium is going to kick out its next bit of radiation. Mm -hmm. um, the, the aspect of the speed of light being a constant and... Uh, the way we keep time uh, becomes an interesting discussion because we look at uh, acceleration of a spaceship and measuring time by the use of light reflecting in mirrors, and this too was mind-boggling to me. Yes, uh, I, I also find this story, I mean, this is Einstein's great contributions, is, is understanding the nature of time and that it's much more fluid than Newton ever thought. Newton thought time was some sort of absolute like space. It was kind of the, uh, the space is the stage on which we play out this universe's story and time is there, uh, what controls how that story evolves. But Einstein, with these kind of new revelations, and that's what I try and tell the stories uh, of how Einstein discovered that time is much more flexible. Um, time can go at different rates for different people. I have two twin daughters. Um, they turned 14 yesterday. Um, and I love the fact that time can go differently at different speeds for them. If I send one of them off on a spaceship out into outer space, bring her back again, um, she might have aged 10 years and her sister could have aged 80 years. I mean, that, that seems extraordinary, yet we know that it's correct. We, we actually have to use this physics um, uh, for our GPS. Um, the satellites that control the way the GPS work, um, they have clocks on board, and we have to take into account the discoveries of Einstein in order to, you know, navigate us around our planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, this differentiation, uh, this, this different pace of time, depending on where you're located in the space-time continuum is, is, uh, uh, is supported by some of the experiments that have been done, isn't it? That's right. Um, but I think one of the, the challenges is sort of um, pushing time to the absolute extreme. So, for example, uh, if we go head back, because we know that not only speed and acceleration, but also gravity um, can slow down time. Um, and so what if we go to a, somewhere of, which is you know, an intense um, gravitational field? So, for example, a black hole, or even if we work the universe back to the Big Bang, um, what happens to the nature of time as we approach these kind of uh, singularities, as we call them in mathematics? Um, and that's something we, we're not very sure about. Um, and there are different models at the moment. And one of the edges that I talk about in the book is, um, okay, does it make sense to talk about what happened before the Big Bang? If time started at the Big Bang then you can't talk about a before. It's a bit like saying, you know, what's south of the South Pole? If the, if the Earth starts there, there's nothing south of it. Um, but uh, maybe there are models of time where there is an, something before. Um, so I think, uh, you, you know, when we push time to its absolute limits, then we begin to really wonder whether we know what time is at all. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in three-dimensional thinking, it, it makes logical sense to say, well, if there was a Big Bang, there had to be a point before there was a Big Bang. Um, uh, yes, it does. But uh, one, one of the lovely things about mathematics is it gives you a language to kind of uh, wrap up um, a space such that, um, you know, because uh, one of the challenges I think people think about the universe, for example, um, it, it could either be infinite, go on forever, but it could be finite and kind of wrapped up. Um, a bit like the surface of the Earth. Um, but then people kind of find that rather uneasy because they say, well, but then what is it in? 
um, because you can see the surface of the Earth because it's kind of embedded in a three-dimensional space which includes the Earth there. Um, But there are ways to use mathematics which don't require it to be in anything. Um, And I think that's one of the challenges of this book. Very often to to truly understand something, uh, I, I found I have to go back to my my language, which is mathematics, mm-hmm. to really make sense of it. And the challenge of writing a book like this is translating uh, something which really <laughs> needs to be written in mathematical language into natural language that somebody like you from the liberal arts um, can can still navigate. Um, so, so I suppose that's uh, you know, my role as a professor for the public understanding of science in Oxford, it, is trying to find those ways to translate um, from my kind of rather foreign world to, to a world that is uh, one that uh, everyone else inhabits. This has probably been talked about in other ways, but there, there was a sentence in here when we were talking about uh, relativity that I wanted to understand better. You said that the force of gravity is an illusion. There is no force. Objects are just free-falling through the geometry of space-time, and what we observe is the curvature of this space. Um, wh- can you amplify that for me <laughs> without using <laughs> math? <laughs> uh, yes, I, I mean, I think uh, uh, that, that is something where um, uh, sort of you can still use the, the language of every day. Um, so if, if you think about um, a piece of rubber and I put um, a, a large heavy ball in that rubber, it distorts um, the, the rubber such that if I then take a small marble and, and drop it onto the rubber, the marble will roll around and try and fall into the well caused by that heavy ball which is distorting the rubber. Um, so th- there's no... Uh, th- th- so actually, this is how you should think about gravity um, sort of rather than a two-dimensional surface like the rubber, we're in a three-dimensional universe where when you put something like the sun, it sort of distorts the the geometry such that the the shortest path between two things turns out not to be kind of an obviously looking straight line, but will, will be something which sort of curves around um, the sun. So uh, it's it sort of... It, very often you change the language and you find out that um, you could talk about it as forces, and that worked very well for Newton. Uh, but actually, when you turn it into saying, well, this is, it's better to talk about it, it like the curvature of, of a geometric space, you find you can make much more headway with that language. So one of the great breakthroughs in science is often finding a new language to tell an old story, which allow, enables you to, to, to make progress. Uh, you, you, you deal a great deal with the question of what is knowable and what is known and what is unknown. Can we know what's inside a black hole? Well, uh, that's a very good question because the maths kind of uh, almost precludes you knowing what's gone into a black hole. There's, um, uh, But Stephen Hawking, one of his great breakthroughs was the suggestion that uh, black holes are not quite as black as we think they are and that they're, they're, they're leaking information. So it might be hard to recover that information, but maybe uh, it ultimately will be released somehow. So um, uh, I think the black holes are one of the great unknowns still. Whether they will always remain unknown by their nature um, is, uh, I think, one of the stories that we'll find out in the future. Mm-hmm. Well, clearly, 30 minutes is not enough for a book like this. We've been talking with Dr. Marcus Dussaltoy. The book is The Great Unknown, Seven Journeys to the Frontiers of Science. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. I remind you that you don't hear our regularly scheduled broadcast on our NPR affiliate 88FM. You can also pick us up on YouTube at Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. Thanks for listening. 